Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks to you, thanks to Dominique, thanks to the organization team for having me here. Uh, it's a privilege, really. I, I really appreciate it. Um, the title is uh, uh, Axiological Proximization in Political Discourse. Uh, I, um, I should first uh, give you a very brief idea how actually this, this research started, the, 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 the most direct prompt. Uh, for the research, uh, research in not so much just axiological proximization, but the whole model of uh, proximization, which is a prerequisite for the model of legitimization in political discourse. The major prompt for developing it uh, came from uh, my uh, analysis of the language of the Iraq War in 2003 and later 2000. And, and four. Uh, as I saw the Iraq war developing, um, uh, and later uh, with uh, some uh, facts that became evident to the world public, like the loss of the main argument for going to war in Iraq, which, is, which was actually the uh, absence of weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq, uh, the following question came to my mind. How is it possible, uh, actually, for the US administration to maintain the stance of legitimization of this conflict, despite the fact that the major premise for war collapsed. So uh, then, the next methodological question was more or less the following. If we have, like, a model of legitimization that should be universal enough to cover long uh, legitimization uh, timeframes and processes, then perhaps there are certain componential parameters to it which actually, as the legitimization process goes on, which are represented in different ratios, in different proportions. So I looked for some constituents of uh, the model, uh, and I wanted to isolate uh, a number of them that would answer this question. Uh, what is it actually that provides compensation for missing premises at some point of uh, of time when the speaker can no longer rely on the or original rationale for like going to war in Iraq for legitimization. So uh, eventually we'll get to axiological uh, considerations, but uh, this uh, this whole talk is based. Uh, I mean, it refers to the whole model of legitimization, uh, which I call STA model or spatial temporal axiological model of legitimization, which is based on uh, what I've been. Uh, terming for the, for, for, for the past three years, proximization. Now, uh, what is proximization? Uh, proximization, uh, I consider it to be one of the most ex effective strategies in, in accomplishing legitimization effects in the political discourse and especially interventionist discourse. discourse. So, the war in Iraq is just like a classic example of interventionist uh, discourse. Now, uh, in short, uh, proximization is a pragmatic cognitive strategy of presenting the events on the discourse stage as directly affecting the NRC. Now, notably, affecting the NRC usually in a negative or a threatening way. Uh, proximization has got three aspects. Uh, these three aspects conceptually bind the entities which are localized inside the dialectic center of the discourse stage. So, in our case, uh, uh, the dialectic center of the discourse stage, I mean, referring to the language of the Iraq War, that would be the speaker as the Bush administration, the NRC, the American audience, and all these entities would collectively be addressed as the so-called IDCs, or inside the dialectic center entities. So, uh, proximization conceptually binds IDCs with the alien outside the dialectic center entities, uh, entities the so-called ODCs. In the case of the language of the Iraq war, we would be talking here of Al-Qaeda, terrorists, uh, terrorist allies, uh, dictatorships, uh, uh, radicalism-based groups, and so on and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> the concepts of dialectic center and outside the dialectic center Dietic Center or IDC versus ODC, these concepts are crucial to the model, as crucial as the three uh, aspects of proximization, which I label spatial, temporal, and axiological. Uh, let's have a look at them. 
Spatial proximization involves showing the ODC instigated, instigated events as physically endangering the IDCs. So looking for language examples, we could imagine, for instance, the Bush administration talking about the possible, uh, the possible physical consequences of using weapons of mass destruction uh, within the American borders, all the imagery based on uh, the memories of September 11th and so on and so forth, buildings falling down, casualties and so on and so forth. So for that proximization of the imminent physical, tangible, concrete then danger. Now, temporal proximization involves showing events uh, of the discourse stage as momentous and historic, and therefore they are of central significance to the IDCs, so in our case to America and, uh, and the Allies. And again, in the context of uh, the Iraq war, uh, that could involve uh, addressing September the 11th as rationale for the preemptive strike uh, in Iraq, and then compressing the uh, span of time between actually September the 11th and the beginning of the Iraq war, and uh, coming up with uh, one central moment in time that would uh, sort of combine uh, September the 11th or compare or equate September the 11th with the moment of uh, invading, uh, invading Iraq. Uh, the essence here would be that here and now is the critical time. If we don't react, now uh, there will be serious uh, consequences. And finally, axiological proximization involves control of a ideological clash. Now this clash, I borrowed a word from George W. Bush here, gathering uh, ideological clash uh, between the IDC values, so uh, in this case American values like freedom, democracy and so on and so forth, and the ODC values, uh, dictatorship, radicalism, terrorism and so on and so forth. Now the clash of such kind could ultimately materialize in the ODC spatial impact upon uh, IDC. So we can already see some kind of connection between the axiological aspect and the, uh, and the spatial aspect of proximization. Uh, to talk about some kind of language uh, data here, uh, let's quote uh, George W. Bush's words of March the, 7th, uh, the 17th, 2003. That was two days before, uh, before American troops marched into uh, Iraq. Uh, uh, in, uh, in a text of the ultimatum uh, to Saddam Hussein, Bush said, remember that on one morning, uh, I mean, he obviously referred here to, to the American society, remember that on one morning, threats that gathered for years in secret and far away led to murder in our country on a massive scale. Now, that's essence of proximization. What there is secret and far away somewhere, actually, we, via language, presented as if it was just incredibly close uh, to uh, the speaker and the addressee, uh, threat at the doorstep, uh, the threat which has got certain aspects uh, which are covered by the SDA uh, model. <clears throat> now, uh, the cumulative effect of spatial, temporal, and axiological proximization is legitimization. So therefore, actually, leg legitimization is the overarching concept. Okay, proximization is kind of subordinate to the overarching goal of legitimization. Now, there's a very simple rationale behind it. Legitimization, uh, which, um, uh, which is documented in the following statement, that political discourse ever sees are likely to legitimize the speaker's preemptive actions against the gathering threat if they construe it as per personal consequential. Uh, which means, in even more simplistic terms, that if people do not care, they will not give the speaker the mandate for the preemptive uh, strike, such as the strike on Iraq on uh, March the 19th, 2003. If people do care, then the speaker can try and solicit legitimization and, uh, and has a good uh, chance of uh, obtaining, obtaining it. Now, what is crucial to the SDA proximization model is the assumption of the constancy of the macro function of the speaker's performance within a defined time frame, like for instance the time frame of the Iraq war, as, if, as a result of external factors, different factors, such as for instance our knowledge of the collapse of the uh, intelligence services regarding weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. If as a result of such external factors, one strategy of proximization is downplayed or abandoned, so, for instance, spatial 
strategy, of spatial temporal strategy. Now the macro function of legitimization is restored by an increase in the salience of another strategy. So in other words, if space goes down, something else goes up. If time goes down, uh, something else goes up. If axiology goes down, this is again uh, restored the overall legitimization pattern by an increase in the representation of another variable. Um, now, in order to test this assumption, um, I carried out a corpus study using the data of the language of the US administration during the Iraq war between March 2003, which was the commencement of the Allies' military operations in Iraq, and June 2004, which was the moment of the delegation of select executive powers to the new Iraqi interim government. Now, in this database, collectively, uh, I analyzed 64 presidential addresses within the two functionally distinct phases. The first phase, which I called phase one, embraced 34 speeches uh, delivered between March and November 2003 and characterized by one functional thing, which is uh, the constant access, rhetorical access, to the weapons of mass destruction premise for going to war in Iraq. Then, phase two, another 30 speeches delivered between December 2003 and June 2004 with no such access, no such rhetorical access to the weapons of mass destruction premise for going to war in Iraq. Now, the tentative observation uh, has been that throughout this period, the spatial and temporal proximization or proximizations gradually give in to axiological proximization. So, uh, proximization that is based on the threat that is imminent, physical, concrete, uh, at the doorstep, uh, gradually uh, gives in to the threat that is more abstract, more based around some ideological clash, not yet materialized, but perhaps one day uh, bound to materialize, and so on, and uh, so forth. Now, a simple rationale uh, behind it. With the strongest, uh, most accessible and uh, most effective legitimization premise gradually vanishing, which was obviously the reference to the possible repetition of September the 11th, uh, the United States wanted to broaden the geopolitical spectrum of the Iraqi conflict and to deepen the ideological anchoring to claim legitimization on a more global scale. And actually, this is also documented in how many countries uh, are referred to in phase two of, um, of uh, the Iraq war. It's no longer actually the, the Iraqi side that is the classic ODC, but it's also Sudan, Burma, Zimbabwe, all the different countries in which there are some dictatorships, all the countries characterized by those alien ODC values and so on and so forth. Now, what is the lexical evidence uh, for it? Well, in order to measure proximizations and to, uh, and to claim with some kind of empirical evidence that uh, spatial proximization uh, at one point uh, is compensated or is replaced by uh, axiological proximization, well, logically enough, we need at least two frameworks. One, which is spatial or spatial temporal, I, 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 I call it, the other one which is axiological. Now, the role of these two frameworks is the following. They need to be able to qualify lexical items as spatial, temporal and axiological to decide which actually let us go into which category. They need to be able to yield counts of the spatial, temporal and axiological lemmas to show the intensity of a given proximization strategy in phase one and phase two. If we do not have access to these counts, then we cannot actually, uh, again, based on some uh, empirical evidence, we cannot judge which proximization is bigger uh, in intensity in which of the phases of the, uh, of the conflict. And uh, finally, uh, the A framework uh, is supposed to show its potential for restoring the function of legitimization despite the diminishing contribution from the uh, spatial and temporal strategy. So, since proximization uh, involves ODCs and IDCs and some kind of movement between them uh, which results eventually in some kind of a clash, then it's pretty logical to suggest frameworks 
in which we have some markers for these two entities on the two poles and then some verb phrases which will put them in conflict. So this was the initial premise be, be, actually before developing uh, the uh, spatial temporal approximation framework. So uh, uh, the first category of this phrases uh, of, of this framework is composed of noun phrases conceptualized as elements of the dynamic center IDCs. So United States, free people, other country, we, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other side, uh, there are MPs in the second category, conceptualized as elements outside the dialectic center, ODCs, Iraq, terrorist dictatorships, etc. And since the essence of proximization is that ODCs get closer to IDCs and vice versa, but mostly ODCs get closer to IDCs, then we need some verbal elements. So the third category, uh, has got this verbal element, it comprises verb phrases of motion conceptualized as indicators of movement of ODCs towards the dialectic center and vice versa, uh, which is manifested uh, in phrases such as they could come and kill again thousands or hundreds of thousands of innocent people in our country, we could, that's the IBC move towards ODCs, we could be drifting along towards tragedy, tragedy uh, this third category uh, demonstrates in, in the essence of proximization. Uh, but there's more to it, because uh, people uh, conceptualize this contact in various degrees. You could talk about anticipations, you could talk about visualizations of contact, you could talk about the actual contact between ODCs and IDCs and effects of this contact. So you need more categories. So in the fourth category, you have web phrases of action, conceptualized as indicators of contact between ODCs and IDCs, such lemmas as destroy, kill, etc. In the fifth category, noun phrases expressing abstract notions conceptualized as anticipations of contact between ODCs and IDCs, so danger from ODCs, of course, threat from ODCs. And in the last category, MPs, noun phrases expressing abstract notions conceptualized as effects of actual contact between ODCs and IDCs, tragedy, horror, etc. Now, uh, to uh, study lexical counts uh, of uh, uh, leading to the judgment about the ST proximization intensity in phase one and phase two of the Iraq war, I would invite you to have a look at table one, which gives you phase differences in the number of lemmas defining spatial temporal framework of the uh, Iraq war record. That's on your, that's on your handout. Uh, table 1. Now you can study this table in two different ways. In a very vertical manner, which gives you qualitative, uh, qualitative conclusions uh, about phase 1 as such, and in horizontal manner, which gives you qualitative conclusions about uh, the, what is different in phase 2 from what there was in phase 1. Now, concentrating on the vertical findings, we can see that the United States of America is the dominant IDC um, uh, and it ensures fastest home front legitimization effects. Uh, that's the essence of the most effective proximization if we are construing a threat to the central IDC and not, for instance, to its allies. Referring to the second category of the framework, we see a conflation of Iraq and terrorists. It's not only uh, the um, frequency balance, uh, so the relatively similar numbers of 330 and 255, as you can see on the handout, but it's also textual proximity, which is uh, that any time Iraq appears in a corpus, in a text, it always appears uh, in some kind of phraseological or syntactic closeness to a lemma, uh, terrorism, terrorists, terror, and so on and so forth, as a result of which you get the, 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 uh, uh, the idea that indeed the two are conflated. Now, the conclusion from the third category is that weapons of mass destruction is indeed the central path premise of proximization, and this can be seen, for instance, by the number of uh, references uh, of the lemma expand used with outside the dialectic center uh, entities, uh, referring to weapons of mass destruction, that's 88 hits in the, uh, in the corpus. Now, uh, 
does active VPs used uh, for adding momentum to the situation and thereby claiming mandate for action, but also passive verb phrases such as we are drifting uh, towards strategy. That's a clever rhetorical ploy for uh, enacting the presidential uh, responsibility for uh, running the nation through this, throughout this difficult uh, period of, uh, of time. Uh, the uh, uh, combined conclusion from, um, from lemmas in categories 4, 5 and, and, and 6 should be that there's a huge agentive capacity of ODC agents. Uh, numbers such as uh, the collective number of hits for destroy, 105, eventually it will drop in phase 2 to only 30 hits. But also the combined number of 328 hits total for IDC, ODC, physical contact anticipations and effects. Now there's a huge number which will be much lower in phase 2 and it testifies to the prevalence of spatial and temporal proximization patterns in phase 1. Now, within horizontal findings, so we can uh, get some preliminary uh, assumptions about uh, what the compensation will be for the missing premise of weapons of mass destruction in phase 2, we should observe that within categories 1 and 2, there's more IDCs and fewer ODCs because event stage is no longer dominated by ODCs actions. Logically, if we do not talk in phase 2, if Bush does not talk about weapons of mass destruction in phase 2, then there's much fewer or many fewer ODC actions predicated. Now, physical threat goes, uh, uh, gives in to axiological threat. I already pointed to the occurrence of the lemma destroy. 105 in phase 1 going down to 30 in um, phase 2. Uh, there's many more uh, lemmas which have more ideological orientation, such as, for instance, expand. Uh, expand, <coughs> if you uh, uh, refer it to ideology, uh, it uh, maintains more or less the same, uh, the, same, um, the same pattern of occurrence. 61 hits in phase 1 vis-à-vis -vis 55 uh, hits in phase, uh, in phase 2. Confront goes even up from 18 to 38 hits. That's another ideological, uh, so to say, uh, level. This all narrows the ideological gap between IDCs and ODCs across the phases and further into phase 2. The summary, preliminary summary of this change from uh, space and time based proximization to axiology based proximization is the following, that in phase 1 we primarily have one ODC agent which is Iraq. Now in phase 2 we have an extended representation of ODCs uh, many more dictatorships addressed in phase 2. Uh, I already mentioned Burma, Sudan, Zimbabwe, and so on and so forth. For the rhetorical reason that it's much more convenient for the Bush administration to talk in phase 2 about the clash of global values and not particular interests, especially if we recall the uh, oil premise for uh, war uh, in, uh, in, the phase, uh, in phase 1. Also, in uh, phase 1, uh, we had focus on a direct ODC threat via the constant analogy to um, uh, the events of September the 11th. Now in phase 2 we have focus on rather ideological background for a growth of such a threat. And finally just uh, one uh, perhaps more bottom level uh, observation. Uh, it's quite interesting what is happening to the concept of weapons of mass destruction in, in phase 2. Uh, it's no longer mentioned as such, I mean, as product, as weapons of mass destruction, but it's mentioned in phrases which give it the aura of its being a scalar concept. For instance, we, uh, oh, they have been running programs for weapons of mass destruction. Now, this obviously is, is, is uh, implicit information. This is a scalar integer which can, uh, which can be interpreted in a number of ways, in terms of uh, some kind of a conceptu conceptual phase, or manufacturing phase or product phase. Uh, of course, uh, each of these interpretations can be effectively countered by the speaker, and uh, therefore it's much more convenient to, for the Bush administration to treat weapons of mass destruction in phase two in this uh, uh, in this way. Now, 
I would argue that uh, the discussion so far and the research on uh, space and time input in uh, proximization uh, leads to the need for building a complementary framework. And I would like to discuss specifically the prompts uh, from the very methodological standpoint, the prompts for building such a complementary axiological framework. I believe that these prompts come, first of all, from the qualitative textual analysis, but also from the corpus counts. So, the spatial temporal corpus counts as they were presented in Table 1. Let's have a look at the textual um, qualitative analysis first. Uh, what we observe already in phase one, and it's, uh, like I said, very much conducive to axiological considerations, even though I would claim that phase one is not based around axiological considerations primarily, what we can observe in phase one already is that the process of spatial and temporal proximization is very much aided by what I would call zooming in on the probability of the conflict. That's very often the case, it's very often the case that first we have a remote possibility drafted uh, like uh, in the example terrorists could fulfill their stated ambitions uh, and this remote possibility is then replaced by a more concrete prediction like for instance we shall act before the day of horror can come and the two get uh, combined they get combined in a sequence which gives you a construal of the initially ideological conflict which turns over time into physical threat. Now, considerations of such formulae are clearly axiological because they bring up that simple question. Uh, what is actually the moment where ideology or ideological constructs need to be interpreted as physical constructs, as spatial constructs? as constructs which could uh, be used to refer to concrete actions. Now, uh, referring to uh, uh, spatial and temporal counts and referring to them in terms of there being prompts for uh, the complementary uh, uh, axiological framework, I'd like to point to the fact that there exist certain entities and they have been included in the spatial temporal framework such as, for instance, threat and danger, whose control as evidently spatial or physical uh, is controversial. Uh, it depends actually on how radical or physically consequential has been the development of events on the discourse stage before the conceptualization takes place. Uh, of course, the more radical such a development, the more of a chance that we should really uh, uh, construe threat or danger in, indeed, uh, physical, so impact-related uh, related terms. Otherwise, we might want to consider such lemmas as threat and danger as constituents of the alien or the ODC-based ideological mindset. And in this way, they are pretty static. They do not exert any kind of direct impact on the IDC, uh, IDC territory. There's two different readings of lemmas such as, uh, or concepts rather, first of all, rather than lemmas, as threat and uh, danger. Uh, this whole uh, discussion uh, on this slide ends with, uh, ends with the question of a threat. Does it belong to the mindset or does it belong to the enactment of the mindset of uh, outside the dialectic center uh, entities. And probably the strongest uh, prompt for developing the axiological uh, framework is the evident decline between phase one and phase two in the quantitative and functional significance of the spatial temporal related forms. So, to cut the long story short, there are far fewer space and time related lemmas in phase two as there are in phase one. So the natural question arises, what is going to be the alternative? Well, the rhetoric has to be built around some forms, some lexical, uh, some lexical uh, formula. And uh, to document this uh, decline, uh, or, or, or to, to have a proof for this decline, you might want to see in table uh, two on your handout for uh, the uh, <coughs> abstracted drops here between uh, phase one and phase two drops in the numbers of uh, select select lemmas. Uh, 
So the question is, uh, the question is that uh, if we no longer have uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq in phase two, and we have no rationale for the dominance of the discourse stage of the dominance by ODC entities, uh, we, uh, uh, as a consequence, encounter drops in lexemes marking the activity of the principal ODC agents. Uh, such as Iraq, terrorists, six man destroy, and so on and so forth. So there are too few spatial and uh, spatially or temporally based lexicalizations to continue with legitimization on the, on the global scale. So the question is, what comes in instead and how does it come instead? So in our case, how does axiology compensate for those uh, spatial and temporal losses? Well, uh, what needs to be uh, to be uh, to be said uh, in the in the first place is that uh, while spatial and temporal proximization can be obtained or effected from the activity of outside the dietic center entities bigger than inside the dietic center entities, now axiological proximization needs much more of the IDC contribution. Now the the reason for it is that by being naturally distant distant from dietic center, the ODC uh, parties are initially less well defined and they need to be juxtaposed against inside the dietic center entities in order to become distinctive enough for the axiological proximization to work. So as an example, if Iraq is to be conceptualized as a regime and if the solidification of this regime is to be construed as a threat to all democratic world, now, this old democratic world must first be described very carefully in due quantitative detail so that the addressee receive, uh, receives some groundwork for rejecting this alien ideology, for rejecting uh, the ODC ideology. So he receives what I uh, term here anti-thesis uh, triggers. So, as a result of that, we simply need more of the IDC uh, input, more of the IDC-related uh, lens. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, it's quite interesting uh, that uh, the axiological uh, framework, uh, which I will reveal in, in, in just a second, uh, has its roots also in the structure of texts uh, characterizing phase two. Uh, there are some uh, very interesting regularities in layout of these uh, texts. Uh, I provide a sample of phase two text uh, on, on the handout, but I will just describe it uh, in a very short way right now. Uh, there's three uh, parts to these texts. First, there's usually the description of the ideological composition of IDC parties, so USA, uh, democracies, and so on and so forth. Second, juxtaposition is built against ODCs and ODC values. And third, those ODC values are construed as dynamic, in the sense of potentially prompting actions which could involve a physical IDC-ODC clash. So, if you look at this, uh, at this uh, schema, and if you remember the uh, initial proposal for the uh, spatial-temporal uh, framework, now uh, this first, second, and, uh, and, and, and third part, they almost exactly correspond to the first, second, and third category, except that we no longer talk about entities, but we talk about values. Okay? And indeed, the axiological framework would be mirroring, in this sense, the spatial and temporal framework, but instead of concrete entities, such as ODCs, uh, Iraq, IDCs, USA, uh, verbs of, 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 of motion uh, and, and directionality in the third category, instead of that, we will have values. So here is the framework. Uh, the first uh, category of the axiological proximization framework uh, is, um, or comprises noun phrases expressing abstract notions conceptualized as values of inside the dietic center entities. So freedom, justice, democracy, and so on and so forth. The second category encompasses phrases expressing abstract notions conceptualized as values of ODCs. So for instance, dictatorship, uh, radicalism, and so on and so forth. 
Now, the threat category will be very complex, so we might want to have a look at the, an example from which this, uh, this uh, category was abstracted. Let's have a look at this example, and especially the part that comes in boldface. Um, George W. Bush's words of November the 19th, 2003. The greatest threat of our age is nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons in the hands of terrorists and the dictators who aid them. This evil might not have reached us yet, but it is in plain sight, as plain as the horror side of the collapsing towers. The danger only increases with denial. Now, if you break down the bolt uh, faced uh, part into certain conceptual, and not really conceptual only categories, but also grammatical categories, we have the following. We have some kind of an alien abstract MP, this evil, then it's kind of uh, put in terms of some remote possibility script. Then it is gradually brought closer and closer to the dialectic center and some kind of analogy is built so that the consequences of the enactment of this evil ideology could be seen. Here is the formalization. The third category is composed of verb phrased or verb framed phrases, sentences, or cross sentential discourse chunks, even though this is rare, that's usually complex sentences, involving, first of all, category 2 MP. So that's this. Uh, alien or OBC-based uh, uh, concept, uh, such as, for instance, dictatorship, radicalism, evil, and so on and so forth. This is embedded or elaborated on by the so-called departure VP to produce the remote possibility script. So we have this evil might not have reached us yet, and that's the end of the remote possibility script. And then we have a noun phrase expressing the effect of the physical contact uh, embedded in or elaborated on by the destination VP. And destination VP in our example uh, uh, will uh, be here. Uh, it is in plain sight. Uh, note the change in modality indicating much more probability here than it used to. And uh, as a result of this, the actual occurrence script is uh, produced. So what we uh, encounter here is a linear discourse sequence which results in what I uh, termed here the realis enhancing modality of the text, whereby ideology of ODCs materializes in the form of IDC, ODC, physical conflict. And that's the essence of uh, axiological proximization. The essence of axiological proximization is to first come up with a remote possibility script which is dominated by ideological uh, concepts and then uh, these ideological concepts are put in such a scenario that materializes them in the form of concrete actions that they would uh, prompt in the actual occurrence script. Let's uh, organize uh, this discussion uh, again. Uh, so, uh, in the second category, this evil and terrorism and dictatorship, via metaphorically, because in the, in the sentence uh, actually preceding, we had dictatorship and terrorism, uh, initiate the remote possibility script. This is further enacted by the first verb phrase, might not have reached this yet. Uh, altogether, the modality creates the departure stage of the IDC ODC conflict scenario, and then we have materialization within IDC ter territory of this conflict, uh, which uh, creates the destination, uh, which is created by the destination stage of this uh, scenario. Uh, Note the collapsing, uh, collapsing towers, uh, all in the so called actual. Uh, current script involving destination VP is in plain sight. Schematically, we talk here about the second category, of course, second category uh, from the axiological uh, proximization framework, second category noun phrase, 
verb phrase, verb phrase of departure, verb phrase of destination, and then noun phrase of uh, of effect. Uh, all these segments uh, producing a linear sequence, uh, which um, turns ideological conflict into a physical clash. There's also a minor fourth category of the axiological framework, composed of uh, noun phrases expressing abstract notions, conceptualizes effects of IDC, ODC, physical contact, but not really used in this complex uh, mechanism of the third uh, category, uh, such as horror, misery, and, uh, and tragedy. Uh, their role is uh, slightly the role is, 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 is uh, rather, mm, rather marginal. Uh, that's the axiological uh, framework's mechanism and, uh, and, and, and structure. Uh, we have not yet answered the question uh, about the axiological legitimization restoring uh, ca capacity at lexical level. So uh, we are expecting spatial temporal lexemes to be, um, or the drop in these lexemes, to be neutralized by an increase in axiological proximization uh, lexemes. Now, uh, let's uh, have a look at uh, the lexical counts um, uh, in Table 4, which gives you phase differences in the number of lemmas and syntactic forms defining axiological framework of the Iraq war rhetoric. Uh, we don't have much time to discuss this rather complex, uh, complex table, so I will just concentrate on one of the categories, uh, the most crucial third category of the axiological uh, proximization, uh, proximization framework. Now, uh, if we think about the uh, realis enhancing modality and uh, all this sequence uh, made up of the uh, remote possibility script and actual occurrence script. Now, uh, if you compare the forms in respectively phase one and phase two, we arrive at the ratio of 9 to 63, which means that there's about 9 precisely nine of such complex forms in phase one of the Iraq four and the staggering number of 63 in phase two of the war. And I call this number staggering for the reason that this category is very complex, that the formula is very complex, and it's very difficult to find uh, structures that would answer exactly the design of the third category of the framework. In other words, that would have the category 2 NP in the first place, and then VP1, VP2, and uh, also the noun phrase of consequences. Now, it was possible to identify 63 of such cases in the corpus of um, phase 2 of, uh, of uh, the Iraq war. Now, um, generally, what we would expect from uh, the axiological framework uh, would be that in phase two we should simply have more lemmas because there should be some kind of compensation for the missing spatial temporal lemmas in the second category and the rhetoric has to be built around something and indeed if you look not only at category three but also at category one and category four there is increase in the total counts of the relevant lemmas, both in category 1, 242, 2495, and category 4, uh, 1672222. Now, uh, it seems that there is one exception here, the drop in the second category between phase 1 and phase 2. But this can be attributed to the fact that category 2 is very much dominated by two borderline lemmas, which is threat and danger. So, they, they are lemmas which intrinsically belong to both the spatial framework, or spatial temporal framework, and axiological framework. Because as I said before, it is impossible to determine 
whether they are markers of impact of ODCs upon IDCs, or whether they are just markers of the mindset. So whether they are, let's put it, static or dynamic. So they belong to both frameworks. Now, if you remove threat and danger from the axiological framework, then, uh, then the readings duly increase in phase two, as is the case with the rest of uh, the categories. Now, it's also interesting that uh, indeed, in uh, what could be expected, and it is the case, in uh, phase two of the conflict, we do have many more IDC-based forms than ODC-based forms, which was the condition uh, summarized in the earlier discussion of why we need these IDCs. We need these IDCs so that we can better define ODCs later, so that we can better reject the ideology of ODCs. Now, if you compare IDC hits and ODC hits, hits in phase two, then we arrive at the ratio of 495 to 356. So there is dominance of these IDC hits, and this dominance would be again even bigger if we removed the borderline lemmas, which is threat and danger, from the 356 count. So without this contribution of threat and danger, the picture gets even, even clearer. Now, uh, moving to conclusions, um, it seems that inter interventionist discourse, interventionist solicitation of legitimization, is usually, firstly, reliant on material premises. The reason for this is that material premises are initially easier to obtain and they possess a more direct appeal to the audience. Very often it's just fear appeal to the audience. So, on the basis of this appeal, uh, the speaker can be granted an immediate approval of his actions. But, attachment to a material premise for intervention is in the long run disadvantaged by geopolitical changes and plasticity and evolution of the discourse stage. Like for instance the finding that there's no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So, this plasticity and evolution of the discourse stage often have the initial premise disappear. So natural is a compensation from ideological premises. Because, first, Axiological or ideological groundworks are much less vulnerable to impact of geopolitical changes. And second, they contribute to setting up discourses which are essentially abstract and involve less specific interpretations. So, in other words, if the Bush administration is to use threat and danger in phase two, the Bush administration is still able to defend the reading of threat and danger in spatial and temporal terms as they were read in phase one. So we come up with some kind of an Orwellian situation that you can believe in two different insights at the same time. One insight, which is that threat and danger are static and they just belong to the mindset of the opposing ideology. And the other one is that they can be direct prompts for physical impact. Now, axiological proximization generates a lot of such forms. And the speaker, who usually faces the situation that this first premise, this material premise disappeared, and very often disappear because of some kind of some kind of development that brings him no credit, like weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It's very much in his interest to blur the situation with axiologically loaded argument. Finally, just last slide. In methodological terms, 
we have here a cycle in which axiological considerations prompt an analyst to engage in spatial temporal discussions no less than the missing points in the spatial temporal framework prompted the axiological argument. Now the evidence for this is even the design of the third category of the axiological framework, which is actually bringing up the, the concept of the action promptability of ODC ideological concepts and how fast, if ever, they can materialize. So in other words, analyzing the uh, prompting, action prompting capacity of threat, danger, dictatorship, radicalism, and so on and so forth, analyzing the potency of these lemmas, these concepts rather, okay, first of all, even though they are lemmas at the bottom level, okay, it brings us back to spatial and temporal considerations once we start to reconsider the spatial impact prompted by these lemmas. So, we are talking in the very long run about some kind of an continual upgrade cycle in which the two frameworks could be upgrading each other ad infinitum. Thank you.